My name's Julia, and I'm 30 years old. I work at a company that creates designs for printed materials like flyers and catalogs. Despite everything going digital these days, I find my job designing for various businesses incredibly fulfilling. Whenever clients tell me they loved how a design turned out, especially for something like a Christmas event, it really makes my day. You could say this job is my passion, and there was a time I thought it might just be me and my career for life. One day, while I was mulling over this idea, my dad had to be rushed to the hospital because his appendix was acting up. That's where I met James, the kind doctor who greeted me. At that time, he was just another face in the hospital, asking if I was there to visit someone. Little did I know, James would become a huge part of my life, first as my boyfriend and now my fiancé. It's funny how life works, you find the most significant changes in the most unexpected places. Even though I always say my job is my top priority, I caught myself getting super excited about marriage, flipping through wedding magazines the moment the topic comes up. I guess I'm really looking forward to this new chapter. But not everyone seems happy about my happiness. My sister, for instance, has always had this way of looking down on me, and now on James too. It's like the more content I became, the more upset she got. It's strange seeing her face change over time, from the cute sister I once knew to someone who always seems angry. Her attitude made me incredibly frustrated, pushing my patience beyond its limits. This whole situation makes me wonder why people who only know how to belittle others often end up with such bitterness etched on their faces. It's as if their outer appearance begins to reflect the negativity they carry inside. Meanwhile, I'm just here, trying to navigate my way through life, finding joy in my work, and now, in my engagement to James. Life is full of surprises, and I'm learning to embrace them, one day at a time. While I was enjoying a quiet afternoon, sipping tea in our living room and flipping through magazines, an unexpected interruption occurred. My sister, Emily, who is three years my junior, snatched the magazine right out of my hands. To my surprise, it was a bridal magazine I was looking at, and Emily couldn't help but question why I was interested in such a thing. I tried to brush it off, telling her it was none of her business, but Emily always had a way of making everything about her. Emily has always been quite upfront, especially about her dating life, proudly stating she's never been single. She launched into stories about her current boyfriend, even though no one asked. It's been the same ever since we were kids. Emily, with her charming looks, was everyone's favorite. She grew up spoiled, constantly affirmed by our parents and everyone else, which made her believe she was the center of the universe. This attitude led her to look down on me, treating me as if I was beneath her. Don't stand too close. I don't want people to think we're alike. She'd say, or, why bother studying? It's not like you'll get better grades. Her arrogance knew no bounds, constantly flaunting her popularity and assuming I was envious. Even when our parents tried to correct her behavior, it was as if Emily's arrogance was set in stone. She never missed a chance to belittle me, a routine that became the backdrop of our relationship. But one day, I'd had enough. As she went on about her latest boyfriend, I calmly revealed that I, too, had someone in my life. In fact, we were engaged in planning our wedding, which is why I was looking at bridal magazines. Emily was taken aback, skepticism written all over her face. She mocked, doubting anyone could truly appreciate me. But when she questioned what my fiancé could possibly see in me, I confidently responded that he was drawn to my optimism and cheerfulness. Her disbelief only grew, suggesting he must see me more as a caretaker than a partner. Yet, despite her harsh words, I knew the truth of my worth and the genuine love my fiancé and I shared, something Emily's cynicism couldn't tarnish. In my determination to maintain my career post-marriage, I hope to convey to my fiancé that being the perfect housewife wasn't in my plans. This revelation led to an exaggerated response from my sister, Emily, who seemed shocked at the idea of me working after getting married. 
Are you marrying someone without money? She quipped, implying that my future husband must be struggling financially for me to continue working. Her insinuation irritated me, but I clarified that money wasn't the issue. My fiancé James was a doctor with a stable income, I simply wanted to pursue my career. My sister fell silent after my comeback, muttering something under her breath as I walked away, feeling a mix of annoyance and satisfaction. The next step in our marriage preparation was introducing James to my family. The atmosphere was warm and welcoming until Emily made her appearance, dramatically altering the vibe. She complimented James on his looks, canceling her plans to meet him, despite my hope she'd be absent. My history with Emily made me anxious. She had a track record of luring away my boyfriends during our school days. Though we were now adults, and I hadn't dated much since then, her sudden interest in James brought back old fears. However, I tried to convince myself that Emily had grown up and wouldn't attempt anything with my fiancé. Despite my hopes, seeing Emily and James interact, with what appeared to be a blush from James, filled me with dread, and then my worst nightmare unfolded. James announced he wanted to call off our engagement, having fallen for Emily, who claimed it was inevitable since James found her more attractive. She brazenly justified her actions, stating James had passionately proposed to her, declaring it a crime to be as charming as she was. Next to her James, my now ex fiance laughed off the situation, expressing regret for not realizing sooner how cute my sister was. This turn of events was a harsh reminder of the pattern that seemed destined to repeat itself, no matter how much I hoped it wouldn't. Emily's lack of remorse and James's cavalier attitude left me in a state of shock and heartbreak, showcasing a betrayal I had never anticipated. Realizing the truth about James's feelings and his ease in shifting affections to my sister left me with a profound sense of relief. The moment I saw his insincere smile, any affection I had for him disappeared completely, leaving behind only a feeling of revulsion. I found myself grateful for the breakup, appreciating that I discovered his true nature before we were married. I'm actually relieved I didn't marry someone who could switch his affections so easily. Consider him a parting gift, I told my sister, genuinely content with the outcome. My sister and James mistook my sincerity for bitterness, accusing me of being a sore loser. But it wasn't about losing, it was about recognizing I deserved better. Their inability to see beyond their shallow victory made me realize any further interaction was pointless. Interacting with you is a waste of my time. Goodbye. Their taunts of me being a sore loser followed me out, but their words didn't sting me if anything. They confirmed my decision to move on was the right one. Afterward, our paths never crossed again, partly thanks to our parents, who, outraged by their behavior, cut ties with them. I heard they married, but by then, it no longer mattered to me. Five years later, at 35, I remained dedicated to my career, finding satisfaction in my work. It was during this time that I met Gary, a client who grew to appreciate my works so much that he began requesting me specifically. Our professional relationship gradually became personal, and soon, he was asking me to dinner, and then on a date. Eventually, Gary proposed, and I was genuinely happy. He was sincere and kind, a stark contrast to my past experience with James. However, the shadow of my previous engagement lingered, making me cautious. I decided to be honest with Gary, sharing the story of my sister and my ex fiancé even showing him a picture of my sister to gauge his reaction. Gary simply glanced at the photo before turning away with a disinterested look, offering me a reassuring smile instead. I've met plenty of people considered attractive, but none of them moved me. I used to think maybe I'd end up alone because of that. But meeting you changed my mind. It's not about external beauty, it's the inner beauty that matters. And that's what I see in you, Julia, he explained. His words made me pause, surprised and touched. What do you mean? I asked, seeking clarity. Gary smiled. In my line of work, 
I've learned to see beyond appearances. No matter how beautiful or charming someone might be, it's the beauty inside that truly counts. That's what drew me to you. You're the person I've been searching for. Hearing this, I felt a deep sense of relief and validation. Gary's understanding and perspective were exactly what I needed to hear, helping to heal the wounds left by my past experiences. His words reassured me that not everyone would betray trust as my sister and James had, and that genuine connections, based on real appreciation and respect, were possible. During a conversation about work, Gary shared with me how he found my enthusiasm and joy for life truly captivating. He described me as bright and beautiful, saying my happiness was evident and that it made me shine. I couldn't help but feel embarrassed by his words, telling him to stop because it was just too much for me. But Gary, undeterred, continued to express his admiration, insisting that I was more charming and beautiful than anyone else he'd ever met. He was sincere in his desire for us to start dating with the intention of marriage. Despite my protests that it was too embarrassing, his compliments didn't cease, even after we agreed to date. Eventually, Gary and I got married, and our life together has been wonderful. We've grown even closer than before, sharing household responsibilities and enjoying our time together, especially on days off when we'd explore new places or check out furniture for our home. One day, while looking at furniture, I encountered someone from my past, my sister Emily, accompanied by my ex fiance James. Emily's appearance had changed. Her features seemed more severe, perhaps a reflection of her age or the deepening of her personality. James, who was smirking beside her, looked like he had lost some weight. Their presence was unexpected, and Emily's voice was unmistakable as she remarked on my appearance, insinuating that I looked plain. Their condescending attitude hadn't changed, with Emily implying that the store's upscale and imported furniture wasn't meant for people like me. James echoed her sentiments, suggesting my presence might lower the store's reputation and hinted it was best if I left to avoid any confusion about their financial status. This encounter was a stark reminder of the past, but it also highlighted the stark contrast between my current, fulfilling life with Gary and the superficiality I had left behind. Despite their attempt to belittle me, I found their attitudes more pitiful than hurtful, knowing the depth of love and respect in my own marriage was something they could not understand or diminish. The harsh and condescending words from my sister and her husband were trying, but I knew engaging with them was pointless. Their loud critiques about my supposed financial status began drawing unwanted attention from others in the store. Frustrated and ready to leave, I tried to pull my husband, Gary, away, but he stood firm, catching the notice of my sister and her husband for the first time. Who's this? My sister demanded, surprised to learn that Gary was my husband. Her reaction was a mix of shock and mockery, questioning why he would marry someone plain like me, and jokingly asking if he was in need of a maid. She bragged about her comfortable life, dining out frequently and hiring housekeeping, implying that Gary and I were less fortunate for needing to work. My sister's patronizing tone and her extension of her sentences in a particularly annoying manner only fueled my frustration. She gloated over stealing my previous fiancé, suggesting Gary and I were doomed to a life of hardship and mocking us for being a perfect match in her eyes. The insults towards me were bearable, but the moment she disparaged my husband, my patience snapped. I was ready to confront her, but Gary calmly stepped in front of me introducing himself as my husband. Despite their dismissive reaction to his name, Gary remained polite and even offered his business card to James. This gesture seemed to momentarily pause the conversation as James glanced at the card, but my sister's attitude remained unchanged, continuing to belittle me as if it were a truth universally acknowledged. In this moment, Gary's composure and the dignified way he handled the situation made me realize the stark contrast between the shallow, materialistic values my sister held and the genuine, respectful love and partnership 
I shared with Gary. His calmness in the face of their provocation underscored the strength and depth of our relationship, highlighting that true value lies not in outward appearances or material wealth, but in character and integrity. Gary, always the picture of politeness, didn't shy away from confronting my sister's rudeness with a cunning clarity. To judge someone as ugly based on looks alone is shallow. But if we're talking about ugliness, yours stems from within, from a personality that delights in belittling others, he said calmly, his words slicing through the air with precision. My sister, so often unflappable in her self-assuredness, found herself blushing deeply, outraged at the suggestion she might be the one at fault. Ugly? Me? How so? She sputtered, genuinely thrown off by the accusation. A truly beautiful person doesn't feel the need to overshadow or harm their sibling. Could it be that your actions towards Julia stem from jealousy, from a desire to surpass someone you actually admire? Gary proposed, unsettling her further. The thought had never crossed my mind that my sister's constant competitiveness and cruelty could be rooted in anything other than disdain. But seeing her reaction, I couldn't help but reconsider the dynamics of our relationship. Gary continued, suggesting that envy was the real motive behind my sister's actions. Taking what belongs to someone else isn't just theft, it's a clear sign of envy. It indicates a struggle with self-worth and confidence. A truly confident person wouldn't need to assert their superiority by diminishing others. My sister tried to defend herself against Gary's observations, but her rebuttals grew weaker, her usual brevetu fading. It was then that James, pale and noticeably shaken, intervened. He had been quietly observing, flipping the business card Gary had given him back and forth, his unease growing. Suddenly, he grasped my sister, demanding in a troubled voice, What's happening? Who is this man? The business card, a seemingly innocuous piece of paper, had become the catalyst for a shift in the air, prompting questions and revealing the undercurrents of insecurity and rivalry that had long defined my sister's actions. It was a moment of revelation, showing that beneath the surface of her confident exterior, lay a complex web of emotions, and perhaps a begrudging respect for me that she herself had not fully acknowledged. I remembered the name sounded familiar, so I did a bit of digging, and then it clicked, Gary Henry. So, what about it? My sister asked, confused. That's the name of the hospital I work at, I said, a realization dawning on her face. A hospital, she echoed, still not putting the pieces together. Yes, Henry Medical Association, I clarified, watching her face change as she connected the dots. He's Dr. Henry's son, the director and head of the hospital, she stammered, disbelief in her tone. She tried to dismiss it as a coincidence, citing the commonality of the surname. But I knew for sure. I've seen him at the hospital with the director. I didn't recognize him at first because I only saw him from afar, but now it's clear, I admitted. My sister speculated that Gary must be a doctor too, given his father's profession, but the business card he handed over told a different story. It was then that Gary humbly revealed the truth to my stunned sister and James. Not every doctor's son follows in his footsteps. And this company, he gestured to the business card, is a well-known pharmaceutical company recently passed down to me from my grandfather. My sister was at a loss for words, and James, realizing the gravity of the situation, attempted to sit up straighter, both of them turning pale as the significance of Gary's identity sank in. Gary continued, calmly disclosing how he knew of their past mistreatment towards me, stating that their behavior was far worse than he had imagined. James tried to muster an explanation, his face ashen, but Gary, with a stern look, silenced him. There's no excuse for such behavior. I'll be informing my father of this, Gary warned, leaving James to contemplate the repercussions of his actions. As we turned to leave, James was visibly shaken, and my sister stood frozen, still trying to process the sudden turn of events. Walking away from them, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that the truth had finally come to light, 
and the respect and integrity Gary carried with him had revealed the true character of those who had wronged me. Leaving my sister and her husband behind, I felt a chapter of my life closing. I couldn't help but wonder what became of them after that confrontation. James faced consequences at work for his poor attitude towards colleagues and patients alike. His salary was cut, and he was demoted, leading to a swift exit from the hospital as gossip about his behavior made rounds. Struggling to secure a new position, his life became markedly more difficult. My sister, on the other hand, had always lived beyond her means, relying on James's income which was never enough to satisfy her spending habits. James's financial downturn and subsequent weight loss were a stark testament to their dire situation. Quickly losing interest in him after his demotion, she divorced James, convinced she could easily move on to someone else. However, the reality was far from what she had envisioned. No longer the young, charming girl, her harsher demeanor had become evident, diminishing her appeal and leaving her lamenting her lack of suitors. She sought solace and sympathy from our parents, bemoaning her sudden lack of attention and even envying my life hinting at a deep-seated rivalry and admiration she might have felt towards me all along. Despite her cries for help, our parents stood firm, advising her to face the consequences of her actions, leading her into an uncertain future away from our family's support. As for me, distanced from the tumultuous relationship with my sister and her husband, I found solace in a peaceful, fulfilling life with Gary. Together, we looked forward to welcoming a new member to our family, a beacon of hope and joy amidst the remnants of past conflicts. As I caressed my growing belly, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the tranquility and love that surrounded me, a stark contrast to the turmoil that once defined my relationships with those closest to me. I'm Amelia, and a few weeks back, I lost my dad after a long struggle with his health. I often catch myself wishing I could have introduced him to his grandchildren, a thought that brings a heavy sigh. Six years ago, at 35, I got married. During that joyful day, my dad and I made a heartfelt promise. I would tell him first if I was expecting. Sadly, that's a promise I'll never fulfill, and it's my biggest regret concerning my dad. His sickness was diagnosed a year ago, and since then, I've put all my effort into being there for him. I visited my childhood home more often, spent numerous hours at the hospital alongside my mom, and made sure to call or video chat even more frequently. Despite all this, I sometimes wonder if it could have been enough. I could have done more, I whispered, lost in thought. My mom, always supportive, comforted me, Amelia, you did everything you could. Your dad knew that, and he was proud. Just then, my sister Freya walked in, followed by a man I guessed was around 48, presumably the lawyer. This is Jack, the attorney, she introduced him, and my mom quickly offered him a seat. As soon as we all settled down, Freya couldn't help herself. The lawyer mentioned dad left us a significant inheritance. I couldn't help but respond, Freya, you know it's not all yours. That exchange soared the mood instantly. My sister and I have had a rocky relationship, worsened by our dad's illness. Her refusal to visit our dad, despite my attempts to bridge the gap between them, didn't help matters. Her attitude has always been a barrier, and it only grew more pronounced during these tough times. In hindsight, my words to my sister might have been a bit too sharp fueled by my concern for our father. However, her response didn't help the situation either. You're grown up, there's no need to be so obstinate, I pointed out, to which she snapped back, I'm not being obstinate. Living in the city and traveling to the countryside isn't as simple as you think. It's just a three-hour drive, I countered, but she argued. Those three hours are not just about time, it costs money. And yes, money is important to me. I'm busy, so please, just stop nagging me. That marked the end of our conversation. Despite the distance, 
I always believed she could make an effort to visit now and then. This belief was a major factor in the swift decline of our relationship. Ultimately, she never visited our father, and the rift between us only deepened. The tension in the room grew until the lawyer stepped in, suggesting we all take a moment to calm down. I'm sorry, I said, offering an apology, which seemed to ease the atmosphere slightly. The lawyer then explained, as I mentioned over the phone, I'm here regarding your father's will. My mother, puzzled, whispered, when was this arranged? The lawyer replied, a few weeks before he passed, your father reached out to me. He asked you to come to the hospital, my mother asked. Yes, I drafted the will there with him, in the presence of his primary doctor. It was arranged that the doctor would notify me upon your father's passing, which is why I contacted you now, the lawyer clarified, pulling out a white envelope and placing it before us. Recognizing my father's handwriting on the envelope, I whispered, that's definitely dad's handwriting. Freya, visibly impatient, demanded, just get on with it. What does it say? You know I'm busy. The lawyer, with a hint of a smile, opened the envelope. Inside, there was a single piece of paper outlining the inheritance, the house, land, some savings, and a storage shed. We were aware of the house and land, but the mention of a storage shed was new to me. My sister, frustrated, turned to the lawyer, wait, what about the farm? The farm? The lawyer echoed, a bit surprised. Yes, the farm. Dad used to work on it as a hobby, I explained. Our father had run a successful business in a nearby town, but decided to slow down after turning 52, considering closing the company to spend more time on his hobbies, including the farm. This new mention of the farm added another layer of complexity to our father's legacy and what he left behind. During my high school years, I remember expressing a desire to take things a bit slower in life. My sister, who was attending college at the time, didn't agree with this laid-back approach. However, both my mom and I, concerned about my dad's health, supported the idea. Don't fret over finances, Freya. We're well prepared with savings, my dad comforted her. With some reluctance, she gave her nod of approval. Following this conversation, my father indeed wound down his business operations and took up farming close to our home. There's something fulfilling about working with the land, he would say, his face lighting up with joy. Witnessing his happiness reinforced my belief that we had made the right decision, though Freya seemed less convinced. Despite promising to return home post-graduation, she pursued a career close to her university, eventually marrying a CEO of an IT firm she met through her job. That's the backdrop to my father embracing farming until his health declined. Freya insisted the farm be considered part of the inheritance. Upon her insistence, the lawyer re-examined the documents and uncovered that the farm was actually leased land. Rented? I thought aloud, mistakenly believing we owned a substantial tract of land. Freya appeared visibly let down by this revelation. The realization that the expansive land my father had used for vegetable farming was least seemed to ease my initial disappointment. Knowing little about farming ourselves, perhaps it was for the best. The discussion then pivoted to how the inheritance would be divided. The house and the surrounding land will go to the wife, the lawyer outlined. Freya smirked, perhaps thinking about the remainder of the assets and how they would be split. The rest, including the savings and the storage shed, should be divided between you three, the lawyer suggested. Savings? That means cash, right? I'll take that, Freya stated, eyeing the liquidity. The total savings amount to approximately $100,000. This sum is not subject to inheritance tax, the lawyer informed us. I want the $100,000 in cash, Freya declared with a sense of victory but such a one-sided arrangement didn't sit right with me, and I voiced my objection. Hold on, I don't agree. Why should you get all the cash? I protested. Because I'm the eldest, she argued, as if that settled it. Fine, you can have the storage shed. What's that even worth, anyway? She dismissively added, 
turning her attention back to the lawyer for further clarification. It's the shed adjacent to the farm. Whoever inherits it will own the structure, the land it's on, and anything inside it, the lawyer explained. Suddenly interested, Freya's attitude shifted at the mention of additional land. It struck me as odd married to a successful CEO, yet her appetite for more seemed insatiable. As the lawyer explained the details about the storage shed, he mentioned it came with a small patch of land, roughly 75 square feet, about the size of a cozy bedroom. He then laid out some photographs of the shed for us to see, showing its exterior and interior. The shed looked quite neglected from the outside, and inside it housed only simple gardening tools like hoses, scissors, and shovels, nothing that caught the eye as particularly valuable. My sister made a face of distaste upon seeing the photos. I don't want this, she declared, scrutinizing the images. They indeed showed nothing more than everyday items, valuable more for their memories than any monetary worth. Fine, you take the cash. I want nothing to do with that rundown shed, she stated, clearly eager to distance herself from what she saw as an unworthy inheritance. Hold on, that seems unfair, I protested, realizing the imbalance in the division. My sister had swiftly agreed to take the cash, knowing it was the more valuable asset, leaving me with what she saw as worthless. Her insistence made me feel cornered, especially when my mother mentioned, as long as Freya doesn't voice any complaints later, I see no issue with this arrangement. Complain? Why would I? Freya quickly agreed to the division, content with securing the cash for herself, leaving me with the shed. I couldn't hide my dissatisfaction, but before I could argue further, Freya dismissed my concerns, accusing me of being overly sentimental. You care more about our father than money, right? She challenged, leaving me momentarily lost for words. Indeed, family should be valued over money, but her swift conclusion to the conversation left me feeling unsettled. In the end, my mother inherited the house and land. Freya happily took all of Dad's savings, and I was left with the neglected shed. After agreeing to the division, Freya even signed a document promising not to raise any disputes over how the inheritance was split, laughing confidently as she did so. I couldn't contain my frustration and later expressed my grievances to my mother. Why didn't you support me? I asked, feeling let down. My mother insisted she had helped claiming her intervention had ensured I received the shed. But I'm not pleased with just the shed, I argued, unable to see its value. You might discover something unexpectedly wonderful if you give it a chance, my mom suggested optimistically. Despite my frustrations, her words sparked a faint glimmer of hope. Maybe there was more to the shed than met the eye, a thought that left me pondering as I tried to reconcile with the day's events. After receiving the key from the lawyer, I made my way to the shed situated beside the field, a serene 20-minute walk from our house along a rarely trodden rural path. The field, which my father had leased until his recent hospitalization, lay fallow, giving the surroundings an untouched, solemn atmosphere. Unlocking the shed, I was greeted by a thick layer of dust, a testament to its long neglect. Wow, it's dusty, I remarked the air heavy with the scent of disuse. Despite the initial disappointment, I held on to the hope that something of my father's a keepsake perhaps might be hidden within. As I surveyed the interior, it quickly became apparent that the shed was exactly as it seemed, a simple, utilitarian space filled with the tools of farming. These items, while potentially holding sentimental value, didn't immediately stand out as particularly special. Maybe I should just take what's inside for now, I considered, my eyes scanning the dim, cluttered environment. That's when I sensed something peculiar about the shed's dimensions. It appeared smaller on the inside than it did from the outside, a discrepancy that puzzled me. Could it have been a trick of the light, or was my mind playing tricks on me, stepping outside for a clearer perspective? I remained intrigued by the anomaly. Driven by curiosity, I decided to explore the shed's exterior, circling to its rear. 
There, hidden among a dense thicket of trees, I discovered a second door. Wait, another entrance at the back? I gasped. The interior wall of the shed had shown no signs of this door. From the inside, it seemed as if there was only one way in or out. This realization hinted at a concealed space, accessible only from this mysterious rear entry. A surge of excitement washed over me. Could this be one of Dad's secrets? He had a penchant for surprises, delighting in the unexpected joys they brought, much like the surprises he planned for my birthdays. Memories of those times brought tears to my eyes as I re-entered the shed, determined to find the key to this hidden door. Sure enough, after a thorough search, I found three keys ingeniously hidden within the handle of a shovel. Rushing to the rear door with a hopeful heart, I inserted one of the keys, and with a satisfying click, the door swung open. Inside this cramped, secluded space stood a large safe, solitary and imposing. Is this from Dad's company? I wondered aloud, the presence of the safe sparking a whirlwind of questions. What secrets did it hold? Was this my father's way of leaving a final tangible piece of himself behind? The discovery hinted at layers of my father's life that I had yet to uncover, a personal treasure hunt he had laid out for me to embark upon. I instantly recognized the safe as the one that used to sit in the corner of my father's office, a sight I remembered from my childhood. Embracing it, I was washed over by nostalgia. This safe was a tangible connection to my father, making the inheritance all the more meaningful. Yet, knowing my dad, this discovery felt like just the beginning of his final surprises for me. There's got to be more, I whispered to myself as I used the second key to unlock the safe. The door creaked open, revealing contents that left me utterly amazed and unexpected legacy. Realizing the importance of sharing this discovery, I quickly secured the safe and went to inform my mother. Afterward, with my husband's assistance, we transported the safe from my parents' home. It dawned on me that these valuable items, undoubtedly part of my inheritance, might have tax implications. Determined to handle this properly, I decided to seek legal advice. Following the lawyer's suggestion, I contacted a certified public accountant, CPA, recommended by a friend, to navigate the potentially complex tax situation. This professional took charge of the intricate details, ensuring everything was in order. A year of navigating these matters had passed when, unexpectedly, my sister showed up near my home. Her visit was out of the blue, especially considering our recent strained relationship over the inheritance. I was just in the area, she claimed, but her uneasy demeanor and the fact that we lived 30 minutes apart made her visit seem less than casual. Despite our complicated history, I invited her in. After serving coffee, she appeared restless, eventually asking, did you win the lottery or something? Her questions puzzled me. I never played the lottery, and it wasn't the season for my husband's holiday bonus. What are you getting at? I finally asked, seeking clarity on her bizarre insinuations. Her mood shifted suddenly to irritation. Are you making fun of me? She accused. Her reaction puzzled me even further, as her line of questioning seemed completely out of left field. I had no idea what could have prompted such an inquiry, or why she would think I had come into a sudden windfall, apart from the mysterious contents of the safe that only my family knew about. My sister was practically buzzing with curiosity about the subject of money, insisting that I must have come into a significant sum. She recounted a recent encounter with our aunt in the city, who unwittingly sparked her curiosity. Our aunt had mentioned receiving a $1,000 gift card from me as a thank you for visiting our father during his illness. This gesture led my sister to speculate wildly that I had stumbled upon some unexpected fortune. You've come into some money, haven't you? Just admit it, she pressed me for answers. Understanding the root of her inquiry, I let out a sigh, which only seemed to irritate her further. What's with the attitude? Are you making fun of me? She demanded. I tried to explain it was simply a gesture of appreciation, which led her to question the source of the funds for such gifts. 
I reminded her of the inheritance, specifically the dirty shed she had disdainfully mentioned, and revealed the discovery of the safe inside it a true treasure trove left by our father. The safe contained a collection of valuable watches, a passion of our father's. Though unsure of their exact worth, it was evident they held considerable value, especially given the modest amount of savings left. This revelation led to a discussion about the potential need for paying inheritance tax, a concern my mother had raised upon learning of the safe's contents. What should I do, mom? I asked, seeking her wisdom. My mother advised handling the matter transparently, suggesting that such secrets have a way of coming to light eventually. Following her counsel, I reached out to the lawyer we had previously consulted, who clarified that the value of inherited items indeed determines the applicable inheritance tax. This led me to take the responsible step of accurately declaring the inheritance, ensuring compliance with the legal and financial implications of my newfound wealth. In seeking professional advice, I learned that a certified public accountant, CPA, could efficiently manage the valuation and tax obligations of the inherited watches for me. Entrusting this task to the accountant, we discovered the collection was valued at a staggering half a million dollars. Given their high value, the implication was clear, inheritance tax was due. The sensible course of action, as advised, was to retain only those pieces that held sentimental value to me and sell the others to someone who could appreciate and afford them. This approach not only made financial sense, but also felt right emotionally. From the proceeds of the sale, I managed to cover the inheritance tax and also extend my gratitude through gift cards to relatives who supported us during my father's illness. This is what had sparked my sister's curiosity. Among the keepsakes I chose to keep was my father's pocket watch, a piece not of great monetary worth but rich in memories. I shared this story with my sister, showing her the pocket watch, trying to convey its sentimental value. However, her reaction was lukewarm, seemingly more interested in what was sold than what was kept. When she inquired about the remaining watches and the whereabouts of the safe, I informed her it was at our mother's house, explaining the safe's size and its historical significance to our father's business. Her response was contemplative, leaving me feeling uneasy about her intentions. Yet, she departed without further questions, to my relief, though I couldn't shake off a lingering sense of worry. My fears were somewhat confirmed that very night, a distressing call from my mother urged me and my husband to hurry to her house. As we neared, the scene was alarming red lights flashing in the darkness, police cars stationed outside. Making my way through the gathering crowd, I found my mother and learned of the evening's harrowing events. She had been preparing for bed when unusual noises startled her. It sounded like someone was frantically searching through the house. Believing a burglar had broken in, and with no one else home to help, my mother made a quick decision to escape through a window, a move driven by fear and desperation. The situation she described was unnerving, painting a night filled with panic and uncertainty. Under the veil of night, my mother noticed the eerie glow of a flashlight moving inside the house, confirming her fears of a burglary. In a state of panic, she sought help from our neighbor, who, upon witnessing the suspicious activity, wasted no time in calling the police, convinced a burglar was at large. Yet, the supposed intruder was none other than my sister, Freya, who had decided to search the safe after hearing about my inheritance earlier that day. Without any way to identify her intentions, both my mother and the neighbor were understandably alarmed. The situation escalated when the police arrived. Caught off guard and enveloped in guilt, Freya attempted to flee the scene, her actions fueled by a misguided panic. Ironically, her escape efforts led her to collide with the safe's door, causing the unsteady safe to topple over and trap her underneath. This accident led to her being rushed to the hospital with complaints of leg pain, leaving us all in disbelief over her reckless actions. Following this chaos, my mother and I found ourselves apologizing to the responding officers for the misunderstanding. 
I also felt compelled to inform Freya's husband about the incident, only to discover from him that Freya had been harboring a significant amount of debt due to her extravagant spending on luxury items. Their recent argument had culminated in her storming out, determined to borrow from mom to settle her financial woes, unbeknownst to us that she had already depleted her inheritance in an attempt to cover her debts. Freya's husband, already on edge from discovering the extent of her financial mismanagement, declared his intention to divorce her upon learning of her latest escapade. This revelation shed light on Freya's desperate actions that night, which had led to a tumultuous scene at the hospital where her husband broached the subject of divorce. The entire ordeal unfolded into a dramatic clash, underscoring the profound consequences of Freya's actions and the turmoil they had wrought upon our family. Freya was adamant, insisting, I'm not getting a divorce, absolutely not. Yet, the reality of her situation became undeniable when her husband presented the divorce papers. Faced with the stark evidence of their fractured relationship, she found herself with no option but to sign them. Now, confined to her hospital bed with a mixture of shock and resignation, she's turning the pages of a part-time job magazine evidently scheming on ways to tackle her debt through newfound employment. This turn of events, while unfortunate, offered a glimmer of hope that she might finally take responsibility for her actions. In the wake of these tumultuous events, I made a significant decision myself to return to my childhood home. The chaos had certainly stirred a deep concern for my mother's well-being in me, but another, happier reason spurred my decision I discovered I was expecting. After much discussion, my husband and I agreed that moving back would be best, allowing us to lean on my mother's support with our growing family. Though I regret that my father couldn't be part of this joyous news, I find comfort in believing he would have shared in our happiness. As I navigate this new chapter, the anticipation of welcoming a healthy child fills me with a sense of peace and forward-looking optimism, despite the recent family strife.